Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today I am joined by host of the Talking Scared podcast, Neil McRobert, and we are getting meta today. We are, yeah. We're going to talk all about ourselves. It's all about us. Yeah. <laughs> Talking meta fiction. I remember, yeah, the first time you came on, we talked about cult horror, I think, several years ago. Mm -hmm. And you told me if you ever want to talk gothic horror or metafiction, I'm here. I'm I'm very much here. I think I was probably a bit optimistic. I think when I said that, I think I thought I had clearer thoughts on this than it turns out that I do. Because when I've been doing my notes and preparation... It's been a whole thing. It's been a whole journey of rediscovery for me. So, yeah. So thanks for having me back and I will do my best. I love that. So your th your thoughts have even changed within the last couple of years on this? Not so much changed. It's just fallen into disrepair and diffused and become less useful. But yeah, yeah, that, that's one kind of change, right? Decay. That is true. So how would you define meta? Just starting off with the, the uh... big one right out the gate. Yeah, I mean, that could be an hour in itself. I'm going to try and not be too long-winded. As, <laughs> yeah. as I said to you off air, I get wiggy on this subject. Um, right. Um, meta, so, right, dictionary definition um, is that it's... I used to know this by heart, but basically the, the dictionary thing is that, that me metafiction or meta is something that demonstrates an explicit awareness of itself um, and its place in a category. So that's... Yeah, that's the dictionary definition. But I think the easier and more profound description is that it's it's a text that's aware of its own fictional status. Generally, that's what it tends to mean when you talk about metafiction, a book that is aware that it is a book, that it is fictional, that it has an author. Um, but I think there are uh, levels in that. Um, and you've got, because you've got, Oh, see, I'm already getting wigged, right? So you get it. <laughs> so <laughs> right. fascinating. I am. <laughs> ah, for a start, I've already gone too far because what most people use metaphor these days is kind of an awareness of trope, right? The whole scream thing, um, an awareness of the rules governing the genre. Um, so the kind of stuff that Stephen Graham Jones does is a lot like that, and it's done really well. Like his slasher stuff, it's a slasher novel that is about the history and the rules of slasherdom. But at no point does it kind of admit its own fictionality. It just plays in a self-aware universe, mm -hmm. right? But then you get the yeah. other end of stuff that is all about, like, the book you are reading is a book, and you've got to deal with the implications of that. And then that's the whole fourth wall-breaking stuff. And then there's a whole other element that I'm also interested in uh, that Stephen King does a lot of, which is where writing and creativity is the heart of the book so it's they're often books about the writing of books but they don't announce themselves as a book so you've got levels of what meta is but that kind of covers most of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think in my picks there's a there's a range with the yeah i've gone for the different same. definitions of of meta yeah mm -hmm. i do love how well it pairs with horror but why do you think that is at the basic level, I think it's because, you know, horror has always been a self-aware genre. Right from the start, horror has, well, started with gothic and then became horror. It's always been rewriting itself, always. It's always been aware of its own rules. Um, and, and obviously, meta is, is a cool way of making the rules part of the story, you know? So that's, that again, is the, that's the Grady Hendrix take. That's the Stephen Graham Jones take. Um and that's fun stuff. But if you'll permit me, and this is a bit highfalutin um, and nerdy, my argument is that metafiction completely whips away like the safety net of certainty. So to my mind, all horror is about uncertainty and doubt. Like, what is it in the dark? What is it that, what's the history of this haunted house? What is the monster, right? If we're certain of things, often we're not scared about them and horror plays with that. But, and this is where I get nerdy, most horror is about epistemological uncertainty. So it's about what do we know and what do we not know? Metafiction is about 
what they would call ontological uncertainty, which is the question of what is real. Because if the book you are reading announces that it's fiction, that's a whole other kind of uncertainty. Where does reality begin? Where does it end? And and my big argument, and this has got a lot scarier since I wrote this down years ago, is that metafictional characters often come to this horrifying realization that their reality depends almost entirely on on an author, on someone creating it, on on information that is constructed. But if you look at our world, right, and you look at the news and Fox News and and Twitter and all of that sort of stuff, you start asking the question, are we any different? You know, because if you apart from what you can touch and smell and see and feel and experience and and know about yourself, what do we actually know that isn't given to us through a lens of someone else's opinion or someone else's construction? So you can even ask the question, are we fundamentally any more real than a character in a book? Um, and then that's a, that's a really scary thought, right? And then And then horror takes that and it adds shit like monsters and demons and ghosts and it but but it's the doubt that gets under your skin i mean that's why i have always said the truman show is a horror movie because it, it is. is for sure yeah so You're that's getting... yeah philosophical sorry comes to the territory early in the morning <laughs> no i i love it i yeah i was going to ask you about how you feel about characters who are genre savvy like characters in Stephen graham jones books or you know like the final girls support group where yeah. you know we are watching them go through this story and they are aware of seeing the pattern seeing the tropes and having to make decisions on like i am in a horror story so i was gonna say that i don't like it but you just mentioned two books that i really really like um but i think there's a reason so I tend to like characters that are earnest and unaware because I like this. Ironically, we're, we're doing a whole thing about metafiction and I'm going to now say that I, I don't really like it. <laughs> I um, I love books that are heartfelt and that often doesn't play well with that kind of gimmicky self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Sparkiness that comes with yeah, it Yeah, I think a kind of smug, smirky, winking at the reader. You know, I don't often love it. Um, but the two books you mentioned, Grady Hendrix's, um, what is it again? Final Girl Support Group, mm -hmm. and Stephen Gray, the the the, the, the SGJ books, the um, Indian the Lake trilogy. trilogy. Yeah, God, yeah. my mind's yeah. gone blank. Um, they they're exceptions to the rule because they they're wonderful because they do something with that self awareness, and I think it's very particular to the slasher in that they both do this thing where they, by being self-aware and by having the characters aware of what's going on, it, that both of those look, books look more deeply at <laughs> really how problematic the slasher genre is in that it has no, normal slashers pay no attention to the trauma or to the fact that the people who survive are not going to be okay. I mean, you know, you go all the way back to Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the, the strap line was always who will survive and what will be left of them but it doesn't actually care what's left of them. The last thing yeah. we see is Sally Hardesty driving away, screaming and laughing. And like, that woman is not going to be okay. But the film stops there. And what those two books that you mentioned do is it looks beyond that. And they it goes kind of goes like, what would the after effects be? And that, in those instances, goes hand in hand with the genre awareness. So I think when it's doing something other than just being smug, I quite like it. But that's quite rare. So most of the time, I'd rather have my characters not be aware of the rules of the world they're in, apart from zombies, because I'm sick to death of people in zombie films not using the word zombie. Yeah, that was going to be my other question. That is something that bugs me. All of mm. the different, like, rotters. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing rotter. in The Walking Dead where they all, like, every little village has its own name for these things. Just like, you've definitely seen a zombie movie. You've got all of the paraphernalia of the world that just collapsed. You definitely know what zombies are. It really annoys me. I do wonder that, yeah, when you're writing a world, though, yeah, how much awareness you have to set up. Like, do mm. these movies exist in this universe? Like, do these reference points exist at all? Yeah, 
I mean, I suppose it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a minefield, right? Because yeah. I suppose if you give a little, you've got to give it all. Um, but it just bugs me when you have books where they people know about when you you get a world where people know about every pop culture phenomenon apart from the one <laughs> that, that is yes. taking place. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, yeah. But generally speaking, genre savviness. I often find goes hand in hand with a smugness that I don't like, but I do like metafiction that is about something a bit more tricky and experimental. I like metafiction that is about the art of creativity or about what is real when it adds, when it adds to the horror rather than detracting from it comedically, I suppose. Yeah. I'm going to say as someone who studied this in school, like what, what did that look like? What kind of books were you reading? Well, I, I just went sorry to slowly. give you flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I just went slowly mad over four years, basically, um, because I, I ended up doing this thesis about metafiction and gothic, and and I had never read that stuff. I don't really know how it happened. I sort of I, I grew up reading Stephen King and like the stuff I still love, like the really heartfelt, honest storytelling. I mean, Stephen King is weirdly a very metafictional writer, but not in the way we normally think of it. But, you know, like these days, people like Chuck Wendig, who I just love, and Clay McLeod Chapman and Rachel Harrison. Actually, Rachel's very kind of genre aware, but in a way that isn't annoying somehow. She doesn't, hers is much lighter in touch than I think than someone like Grady Hendrix. I much prefer her stuff. Um, but yeah, I read this heartfelt stuff and then I ended up just doing four years of like really high end experimental horror fiction. And I don't know how it happened. And, and I went mad. Genuinely, like nearly lost my mind doing it. Um, but I read all sorts of stuff. Like, I just, the, the whole spectrum of what we're talking about, I read everything from, like, I would argue that, for example, Chuck Palahniuk's Haunted, I would argue is metafictional insofar as, um, have you read Haunted? I have not. Oh, right. Well, I don't want to spoil it for you, but are you aware of Haunted? This is a segue, but are you aware of Haunted? Are you aware of the short, the story that starts it, Guts? I'm aware of the reputation it has. Yes. Okay. Oh, you'd love it. You must read it. Um, okay, I will. But that that's a book that has no over-the-top metafictional kind of this is fiction. There's no fourth wall breaking. But what it does is it says, it makes the point that it's easier to suffer and then sell your story than to write a book. And I would argue that's a metafictional point because it's about the reality of publishing, you know, but that's a very low level, subtle metafiction. And then I read a book um, called Frank, which is this like super niche indie experimental retelling of Frankenstein in which the book itself that you're reading is a monster and it's almost written in code and you've got to work out what the monster is trying to say. And it's a whole typographical like just labyrinth um so i read like that that's like the the two extremes of what i read you know there was so much wow yeah so much hurts my head to think about and my heart (laughs) and your heart well should we talk about some movies that play with the idea of horror and sure storytelling yeah sure well, we talked about Scream earlier, and I think when you tell someone meta horror, this is probably going to be one of the first things they think of. Mm-hmm. I there's a lot that I like about Scream. Scream was one <laughs> of the first movies that I I fell in love with. But I think one of the things I like is that I think as viewers, you kind of feel like if I'm the genre savvy character. I would outsmart this situation and Mm -hmm. I simply would know all the right decisions to make. Like we get that snarky phone call with Sydney where she's like, no, I hate slasher movies. It's just like stupid girls doing this and running up the stairs when they they should be running out of the house. And we see later in the film, as soon as she's in that situation, she also runs up the stairs. Like you can't control what happens to you when you're in that situation. Some things are just instinctual despite you knowing (laughs) the tropes. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a bit of a thing because my two, you know, people online always ask for like, what is your unpopular horror opinion and stuff like that? Oh, no, here we go. <laughs> so, no, I, no, I have two, I have two that I just always think are going to get me banned. Like, one is, which I'm not going to rehash, is I despise Kubrick's The Shining. Um, and the other is that I think the entire Scream franchise is overrated. <laughs> 
and uh, I can see that. The, yeah. It is the indie, it, not not the indie. It is the horror community's like franchise darling. Mm-hmm. So I fully understand. A lot of people just have nostalgic connections to it, and I've I've heard a lot of people, especially people who love Stephen King, say that about the the Shining movie, just because of how different they are and that yeah. they're not. Yeah. I mean that's the whole of the podcast because I get I get angry quickly, Um, but the scream thing I I rewatched them all recently like well Mm -hmm. yeah 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 in the last six months I just think they've aged so weirdly the first one has aged way less than the rest. Um, You think so? Yeah, but what what's the one? Is it Scream Two or Scream Three when it's? Uh, it's, sorry, it's, it's really awful to say, but it's, I, I, I basically conceive of these movies and date them by Courtney Cox's hairstyle. Um, yeah, and her really the, short bangs are her third one. That right? Okay, yeah. So that, I mean, the terrible thing is that that is the most memorable thing about the movie, right? I just I couldn't watch it. And then the new ones are pretty good. I really like mm-hmm. Scream Six. I mean, some some people didn't. I yeah. really liked it. I thought it was great fun. Um, but I'm I'm not a massive fan of them, and I don't like. I object to the fact that they make the the horror nerd like such an obnoxious character because <laughs> it just it just played into what people thought about people like me back then. Like I'm not a Randy. <laughs> yeah, no one is. All right, I was like, I also have a Cabin in the Woods on here, which I think is another one people are going to think of when you say yeah. meta horror. And especially when you were talking about the the inevitability and do we have choices. I won't get into spoiling it for people that haven't seen it, but I just I love it so much. <laughs> don't care for it. Oh, no, I, love I it. don't care for it. No, I love it so much. <laughs> I just I adore that movie. And it's what I love is how many times you can watch it and see different things. So again, we won't spoil it, but when you find out what's actually happening. And then you see like what all the options would have been for what could have happened. And then when you see all of the, well, I don't spoil it, but you know, all of the, what are the, what are the better word, cages contain the, the different mm-hmm. things. And you see different things every time. It's a great movie to kind of pause and really pour over. And, and anything with Bradley Whitford in it is a winner for me. So I just, yeah, I think it's great. In fact, I'm going to watch that again tonight because my wife has never seen it. And, She's not a horror oh, perfect. fan. Perfect. And I feel like it's a great gateway movie. Will you explain the references throughout? Or Obviously, yeah. Well, she, yeah. 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 She won't have a good time. It's been me territory. talking a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Learning experience. Yeah, indeed. The one I'm too frightened to watch and I've never seen is uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmares. Because, really? yeah, because I'm terrified of Fred- Freddy Krueger. Always have been. As a little boy, it was like a primal fear. I have this real, real memory. And it's like a, a fragment of being on my grandmother's staircase, walking downstairs. And one of my friends, who was older than me, and obviously just a bully when I think back, yelled at me, Freddy Krueger is behind you. And I, I could still, I, I must have been about five, and I can still feel the terror. And I years before I saw the film, I saw the film when I was about 12, I was just aware of this figure who just, you know, killed kids and stuff and just terrified of, of, the, of the character. And I, I love the films. I love them. They scare me to death. I love them. But I really don't need a Freddy Krueger that can cross the fourth wall and come into my world. I just don't need that in my life. So I've never watched it. That is fair. I, I have watched it and I... I quite enjoy it. I agree. Freddy Krueger was one that really scared me as mm-hmm. a child, even before I really knew what his whole deal was. But then mm-hmm. once I discovered that he kills you through your dreams, as you can imagine, as a child, that was horrifying. Yeah. I'm like, still is to me. <laughs> still is to me. I'd, sometimes I don't like to go to sleep because I have quite, even now, I have quite a lot of Freddy Krueger dreams. He's in my dreams about really? once a month. Yeah, yeah. About once a month. And I wake up and even now in that weird, not quite awake state, you know, I wake up and sometimes think like, I don't want to go back to sleep in in case he's there and he kills me, you know, Um, hate it. Yeah. But but I still watch the films now and again, like the early ones. I think they're just so good. But yeah, I I will watch New Nightmares. It's probably aged quite, I could probably deal with it now. But I was just so scared by the concept for so long um, that it's become a bit of a thing in my head. Uh, But the other ones that, 
some I noted down to talk about. Um, and again, it's that spectrum of what is overtly meta and what is more subtly meta. I would always point to the Blair Witch Project as a certain strand of metafictional filmmaking, insofar yeah. as it's all right. It's not revealing the artifice. It's not saying that it, this is fiction. It's quite the opposite. It's saying this isn't fiction. It, it's saying this is real, which forces you to think about filmmaking in a different way. Mm-hmm. So even though it's doing the opposite of what Meta normally does, which is to address you to the fictionality, it goes the other route, but in doing so makes you come to the same place, which is to really think about what a film is. So I, I think that's really important. Uh, and then on the, in a similar vein, just some two films to mention quickly, which I haven't seen for years, so I can't say much, uh, but they do similar things. And one is Behind the Mask, the Rise of Leslie Vernon. Have you seen that? Pieces of it. Right. Um, so you know the premise. It's basically like, it's what yeah. what if a slasher was real and here's a documentary about him and his yeah. background and what he does. Um, and again, it pretends to be real, but isn't. And you've got to deal with that, that tension. Um, and another film that's much darker, because Leslie Vernon's pretty fun from what I remember, but a film that's much darker, it's a Belgian movie called Man Bites Dog that actually came out I think before Blair Witch. And again, it's like a found footage film about a Belgian serial killer who gets in touch with, with a document documentary crew who follow him around, but they get kind of involved in his crimes and it becomes a whole thesis, I suppose, on like the responsibility of making a documentary and where the line is between just observing something and taking part. And it, it's weirdly, you know, the whole thing about, when you watch wildlife documentaries and you're screaming at the camera going like, help the penguin, you know, there's a penguin dying. Why don't you feed it? And there's this whole code that they, you know, documentarians don't get involved. They don't intervene. Well, man bites dog yeah. is, is kind of that. <laughs> it's kind of a, a bit of an, a, a commentary on that, but where, when they get yeah. involved, they're, they're killing prostitutes in Antwerp or something. You know, it's, it's, it's really dark. Um, but very good. Adam Caesar mentioned it when we did our oh. true crime episode because we were talking about, yeah, the ethics of watching true crime or participating in this yeah. true crime culture. And he brought up Man by its Dog as one of the movies we talked in. Also, yeah, this kind of, sorry, getting sidetracked, but what do you think about that genre of kind of like fictional true crime? Like, Richard Chismar chasing the boogeyman. Well, that's one of the books that I've added to my honourable okay. mention. Right. Actually, yeah, okay. no, because I, I, I don't have many examples. I love that book. I love that book, but I, I like it for things that are probably nothing to do with its central conceit. Um, okay, but we can get to it if you like now or whenever. Suits okay, you. perfect. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we can get to it then. Sorry, I am like all over the place but back to Wes Craven's new nightmare now I am wondering if that was one of the first franchises to do kind of like a meta installment because I've noticed in a lot of horror franchises the later installments will get more meta like Mm. yeah in Seed of Chucky Jennifer Tilly is Jennifer Tilly playing Tiffany in a movie about Chucky you know Hellraiser Hellworld has a whole culture where there are Cenobites and it's this fictional video game you have to solve the puzzle and see Pinhead like I think I'm I'm just interested in that as a cultural phenomenon that the longer we have these franchises Mm. they need to become more aware do people just not suspend their disbelief enough that we need to acknowledge it they don't want to believe there's a world where people aren't aware of this I think it's a kind of exhaustion. Um, I think, and sometimes it's not a good thing, you know, like something, because in a weird way, it's almost the same phenomenon as the spoof, you know, because like Mm -hmm. Scream went along so far that it becomes, it enters the public consciousness so much that then it's like, oh, how can we make money off this in other ways? And then then people, once something becomes exhausted, it becomes a target for comedy, I suppose, until people get tired yeah. of that. And then it goes away for a while, and then it tends to come back in a new, earnest form. 
you know, it, like the Batman thing, it, it it becomes it's great, it's great, it's great. Then you get the one with like nipples on the bat suit. Then you get the spoofs, and then you get a break, and then Chris Nolan does the gritty version. That's kind of the the trajectory that the most cycle. yeah culture seems to go in. And I think in horror films, maybe I'm speculating, maybe um, a franchise to kind of stave off the spoof. Maybe they think, well, if we take control of it, maybe that is that that defangs the spoof, and we also yeah. get to make a new movie, and we get the we keep the IP, and we get the revenue. Maybe it's that cynical. I don't know. But I think with something like Chucky, which is always a little bit like nodding to camera, a little bit wry, it kind of works quite well. I In haven't the seen the Hellraiser one, yeah. movie, so I don't know what the hell that I can't imagine a kind of self aware Hellraiser because they're so pole faced to begin with that I can't imagine how that goes. A lot of people hate that one, <laughs> but I have a soft spot for it. But I think because I went into it knowing how much people hated it and it was just not as bad as everyone said it was, I was expecting an absolutely awful movie. Um, that one is more that there's a, a cultural awareness in some way, but it still is like this fictional video game. Pinhead and the Cenobites are still very much the same. Right. Okay. Ah, so it's kind of spun off into them. They've made... They've made things. They they exist, but then over here, people have yeah. kind of you know, bought the IP and started making things. But but it doesn't change <laughs> yeah. the source material, right? Okay, that's quite. Yeah, that's a more. Yeah, Pinhead isn't isn't cracking jokes as he's. Yeah. Said. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, the other one I would mention. Sorry, it just occurred to me. The other film that I haven't mentioned, the one that people probably scream at me for, maybe the most meta moment in any horror film ever is in Michael Haneke's funny games um where so for those who don't know funny games is kind of like the ultimate home invasion movie although i prefer the strangers um and these two kids break into this house and they're they're doing awful things to the family and they're they're filming it no no they're that's the point they're not filming it it's you're watching it through what you think is a standard third party camera you know like a normal film mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden after a particularly awful scene one of the kids walks up to the camera and I can't remember if it happens at the same time or if it's two moments, but there's one part where one says, why are you watching this? And again, it's that, it's mm -hmm. that, suppose that true crime thing, that complicity, the ethics of what you're doing. And there's also one bit where they, they actually rewind the film. So you have to watch an awful scene for a second time. And it's really driving home the idea that, which which pisses me off, if I'm honest. It, it drives home that there is something wrong with you, the viewer, for watching it. It's kind of like trolling the audience. And I'm always a little mm -hmm. bit like, well, you don't get to have it both ways. You don't get to take my money and make me feel bad, you know, and then ca just claim that it's art. You don't get to do that because, and it's it, it gets worryingly close for me to that, to, to a filmmaker buying into the idea that there is something wrong with the kind of genre that he is making. And I think there's enough people out there tell us horror films are bad and that, that it makes us sickos and weirdos. We don't need the people making the horror films to be doing that as well, if at all possible, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I mean, it is a great film and it's a clever moment, but it's just that the underlying philosophy gets, annoys me a little bit. There'll be a lot of film bros who, who, wish, who disagree, disagree with me entirely. Um, yeah, wasn't that his intention to make you feel bad about wanting violence in film? I think he's that's what he's doing, but then don't make the film, Michael. You know, like if if you feel so strongly, don't don't make the film. Like I, I'm not the problem here, you know. Um, yeah, but the other one that I will say, it's a great little. I mean, this probably isn't even available to on DVD. You probably have to like search the the back alleys of YouTube for this. I don't know, but it's it's a film called. I'm pretty sure it's called the Last Horror Movie. And it's this proper lo-fi British thing where a serial killer <laughs> is filming. It's a bit like the Poughkeepsie tapes. He's, um, he's filming his crimes. And then he, if I remember rightly, he hides the video cassette of his crimes in a video store. And then when the person takes that film home, they become the next victim. Oh, wow. Um, but the, the film ends with him that the killer talking through the tv to you and you realize that, that by watching the film you're the next victim mm. it's quite a cool little thing that's fascinating mm. 
which is a better idea than film. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It works better as a concept. Mm. This episode is brought to you by Fangoria, the world's best horror and cult film magazine since 1979. Listeners can use code Books in the Freezer to get 20% off their order. That includes, of course, merchandise and first time subscriptions and single issues of the magazine. Not only are there tons of articles and interviews about upcoming horror movies, there's a regular segment by Stephen Graham Jones all about slashers called Slasher Nation, so you're going to want a copy. So again, that is code Books in the Freezer, and thank you, Fangoria, for supporting the show. All right, well, are we ready to talk about some books? Uh, Yeah, I'm always ready to talk about some books. I can start off with, I know a novel we have both read, Plain Bad Heroines by Emily Danforth. This is a dual timeline story about Brooke Hunt's School for Girls. The first timeline is 1902, Brooke Hunt's School for Girls in Rhode Island, where two girls, Flo and Clara, are obsessed with this writer, Mary McLean, and her memoir so much that they start the Plain Bad Heroine Society. One day, while they are secretly meeting in the orchard, they are met with untimely deaths as they are attacked by a swarm of angry yellow jackets and their bodies are discovered with a copy of mary mclean's book then we switch to present day where we are following Merritt emmons kind of this wonder kid who has written a book about the queer feminist history in brookhans and this is now her book is getting adapted into a horror movie and so they've tapped this former child star audrey wells and this I love the word she uses, celesbian, like celebrity, <laughs> lesbian, Harper, Harper. <laughs> um, and then the th- we follow as the three of them arrive on set at the boarding school in Brookhaunt and past and present become entangled. It's very much a story within a story. And throughout, I love fictional footnotes. Yes. And like, this is chock full of them. And there is a very much like aware omniscient kind of snarky narrator throughout Mm -hmm. the book so it's like this extra voice watching it tell what did you think about it i well if i'm honest it's been a while since i read it and i read so many books that things kind of as i said decay but i remember loving it i mean i don't remember much details of the plot but i remember loving it but i remember weirdly for me being far more interested in the present day stuff with the film. I was too. Yeah, but that's kind of weird to me, right? Because all the gothic stuff's in the past within this creepy school. Um, mm-hmm. But I just loved the characterization. I, I've, I've got quite a, a love for the skewering of Hollywood and sort of, you know, zeitgeisty culture. I think it's funny when somebody really smart takes a knife to that. And Emily Danforth is great. And um, so I loved the contemporary stuff. Um, and I love the character of Harper and, and all of that. Um, and I, I like the mishmash of like the sleek, hyper real, almost Brace and Ellis esque contemporary section. And then you've got the, this really kind of Tim Burton school back in the turn of the century. And I and the and the, yeah. the, the I remember there was, there was an orangery. And I always wanted to I, I really love that there's an orangery because it's just such a nice word to say and there's got yeah. and the, the poisonous things in there. And it's quite Adam's family. Um and so I like that, and I I enjoyed it, and I but I love the footnotes like you. I like I like any book with false footnotes because I like to not yeah. really know where the truth is. Quite often I have to I have to like go to Google and is this a real book? And, and when you get sometimes they they sp- sprinkle real things in amongst the fake stuff. I just love yeah. that. I just love not knowing where the lines are. I love that especially in books that have. Um that are about like a fictional film director and they create this whole culture where there's like, Oh yeah, there's film festivals. And there's like, um, I remember that experience with night film, which I think also had a lot of fictional footnotes and fake like web pages. And I just feel so, yeah, it's that line between fiction and reality. I just feel so immersed in the story in that time because it is such a wider world. I was I was lucky enough recently. Um, I inter- I recorded an episode with John Langan that will it will go live. It, it'll either be live or it will go live when they just check my back catalog when you listen to this. I don't know timings. Um, but he gave me his. So John Langan wrote the Fisherman 
for those who don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did a whole thing about the law and the interconnectivity of his of his different stories and how they all tie in. And he was gracious enough to give me a preview of the novella that opens his next collection. And it's got this amazing, you will love it, Stephanie, because it's got this amazing story called Lost in the Dark in which John Langan is the protagonist interviewing a student he used to teach who has made a film. And there's a whole thing about whether the film she made is a documentary or is it a fictional horror film? Did the things really happen or did they not happen? And there are legends about the local area in the film and in the story, some of which are real and some of which are not real. And like Larry Fessenden is a character and but other people are there's like like you said there's film festivals that are real and some are not real and and it's the whole thing and i had to google whether every character was fake or not i had to like the the student that he taught i was like is she real or not it was just a complete trip and it's exactly what you're talking about that 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 blurring of little real details and fake stuff yeah did you ever listen to the black tapes podcast I'm still waiting to die from the unsound. <laughs> it's me too. I, when they gave that warning, I'm like, I don't, mm. what if I do get cursed in some way? What if that... I'm marked for death after I listen to this? But that was one that immediately had me Googling because it is just presented in such a matter yeah. of fact, mm. documentary style way. Yeah. Like with the, what is it? The Gregory and all that. And, all the, and some of the law is real, mm. right? Some of the, the demonic yeah. law is real. And then I was... Because I just think, like, we're smart people. And I, I should not be gullible enough to think that if this was real, that, they, that the, the man on the podcast with the deep voice, he's not a real person, obviously, but I swear I Googled to see if he was. Yeah. <laughs> it is absolutely. Sorry, back to plain bad heroin. Yeah, sorry. I am I still, all over I, the place today. No, no it's me. It's like um, little John Langan. <laughs> It's all good. I I also think I connected with the modern timeline more, but that I think is because we have our three established characters who are very interesting and well mm-hmm. fleshed out that we follow throughout. And then the previous timeline, you're following kind of several different characters and you're not really following like, like Flo and Clara are dead at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So we're not really spending a ton of time with them but it was interesting to see where everything went and then oh the the buzzing of yellow jackets that just is throughout the story yeah yeah it's very it's a it's a big book though right it's about 700 pages I remember. It is. yeah so you get it's a real one to get immersed in it's a, it's a book to kind of curl up with over a weekend and really really enjoy it i don't think it's a book that particularly works if you read a chapter a night because it's so dense and and you know well chewy and dense and all that sort of stuff you can't play with it i would say it is room temperature Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things i still think about to this day and i did i felt like i personally was haunted by the sound of yellow jackets (laughs) after reading the story so that is plain bad heroines by emily dan okay so I've picked sort of three books that takes on a bit of a journey because before i talked about the different layers of metafiction and I think of them as kind of internal metafiction and external metafiction. External metafiction is the more extreme stuff where it's like, oh, look how clever I can be and what's real and this is, you know. And then the internal metafiction are books that make storytelling or, or, or fiction or art or whatever kind of the focus of the story without breaking the fourth wall. And I think there is no better example of that than Stephen King's Misery. And I was reluctant to pick this one because I think no one no one needs to be told to read Misery, right? Because everyone's read Misery. But it's a, if, if you want to get into metafiction and think about it and get your head around it, it's a great place to start. So everyone probably knows, but the premise is quite simple. Paul Sheldon is a best-selling writer of sort of gothic romances starring a character called Misery Chastain. And he hates her. He hates misery because he wants to be a literary respected writer. Um, And he's in his latest book, he's killed misery, off, which has gone to press, but is not yet published. He's killed misery off and he's written a new book, which I think is called Fast Cars, which is a sort of, you know, like Pulitzer Prize winning hopefully like really realist novel about crime and inner city deprivation and 
and all that kind of stuff. And he's really proud of it. And he finishes it. And in the most ridiculous style imaginable, he has like a, a glass of champagne and gets in his car. And there is only one copy of this book because he doesn't, there's like literally one manuscript because, well, that serves the plot. And he sets off driving with his one manuscript, having had a couple of glasses of champagne into a snowstorm, crashes his car and gets found by Annie Wilkes, who is a nurse who has a very dark past, um, who takes him in and just happens to be his number one fan. And then Paul's in bed in bits, broken legs, broken ribs, can't move. And it turns out Annie is a not so nice person who when she fight when she finds out misery is dead doesn't react well um and makes him squeal and then she basically he's trapped in her home and she's withholding medication she forces him to re to to first of all burn his new classic novel and then rewrite a new misery story to bring misery back to life uh, so that's the plot everyone i think everyone knows that but the reason it's metafictional is because, for a start, it's about King. So it's autobiographical. And, and, and King denies this. He says that misery represents cocaine because it was he wrote it as he was getting over his addictions. So he says misery re represents cocaine. And, and there's a lot in the book about Paul Sheldon's need for drugs and pain relief and addiction and all that sort of stuff. But misery, uh, but Annie Wilkes definitely does not just represent cocaine. She represents the readers who up until that point in King's career have kind of pigeonholed him as a horror writer when he wants to be so much more. The people who love him would always say he already was so much more. But, you know, that was the idea that he was trapped in this genre and he wanted to escape it. And, mis and I keep saying misery. Annie Wilkes is the, the ravenous fan who will not allow him to do something different. So that's like the surface level self-reflexive self-aware thing but then you've got the fact that he has like like transcripts and reproductions of the manuscript in the book where he's writing the misery novel the new one there's like the, the his, his typewriter is missing a letter e so there's no e in the manuscript so you have to kind of work out what he's trying to say so you've got the act of writing is being represented but here's where it gets clever paul sheldon writes gothic novels and the the central concept of gothic is that it's that those that gothic is about being trapped in a claustrophobic space with some kind of external threat and it used to be a patriarchal threat you know the baron would take you to his castle and lock you up and and you'd be trapped in a dungeon at the bar at the baron's whims and so that's the kind of story that paul shells that paul sheldon writes not only is paul in that position where he's trapped in a room being forced to do things by this powerful person. He also represents the act of writing Gothic as something that is Gothic. Because if the kind of, if the kind of books he writes are all about being trapped, then he feels trapped into writing them. So the claustrophobia of a Gothic castle kind of becomes the claustrophobia he feels being trapped inside the genre. So it's a yeah. horror novel about the horror of writing horror. And I just think it's the cleverest thing King ever wrote. That is the first time I've heard that interpretation because I've only ever heard that Annie Wilkes represents cocaine from right. King himself. Yeah, well, that's nonsense. I I don't agree. <laughs> and yeah, like so. Yeah, um, that's my theory. Anyway, it took me years to come up with it, but that's that's my theory. And people can disagree if they want. But have you read Misery? I have not, and I have not watched it really wow i know i mean no it judgment the there's lots of things i haven't seen but do you know about the scene do you know what happens in the scene um you're talking about where i know in the movie she breaks his foot but it's different in the book but have you seen right? the that... breaking foot in have you seen that clip yes right okay right <laughs> right yeah because in the book she cuts it off with a, with an axe and then she like sutures it with a blowtorch. And the thing I've always found fascinating is that the, the breaking, the breaking, the hobbling, as she calls it in the film, is so much worse. Like having your foot cut off and, and, and like cauterized with a blowtorch, like it's grim. 
But there's something about like having it smashed sideways with a sledgehammer that's so much worse. Like like Rob Reiner who made the film just it just I don't know how we made that call, but what a call because that oh that scene when it goes sideways, my god, it's one of the worst I've ever seen. I've seen so much more worse gore, but that oh my god, it's awful. Yeah. Well, that and it doesn't cut away. Can no. You see it. Hmm. Mm. Oh, I'm literally, you can see me through the camera, Stephanie. I'm proper wincing at the thought of it. It's horrible. But the book, oh my God, the book is so clever. It's there's so many layers. It's just, it's the, it's not my favorite King book, but it's, I think it's his best book in terms of craft. I think it's the best thing he ever wrote. There's other things I love way more, but the skill behind that story, my God, it's amazing. That's interesting. I'm interested to go in it thinking that with that lens in mind so i know i was planning on actually i've never read carrie and i okay. know it is the the mm. big anniversary this year so i was thinking that this was going to be the year i was going to read it i feel like i've seen every adaptation because i love carrie but i've never yeah. read it well again carrie's kind of meta because it's it's yeah. written like dracula and that it's a collage of texts so it's Again, it, it had... forces you to think about textuality and the fact of how documents mm -hmm. are made, you know. It's funny. I did mention that when I was talking with um, Adam Caesar about the true crime episode, because we were talking about uh, White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson, which is like kind of a YA carry retelling, but with a okay. podcast. Um, and I was saying I haven't read Carrie, but yeah, isn't it also kind of playing with this like true crime journalism meta like we're reading articles about the thing that happened yeah yeah there's, there's, this, there's, this, there's this book in it that, all, that they quote all the way through that's called the shadow exploded um uh -huh. which is like the fake book written about the events of oh, the book you know so it's um, like, that's so cool like the pulpy true crime novel about yeah it. yeah exactly that yeah it's it's real it's a great book and yeah like it's 50 years this year right i'm, I'm going to be doing a special um, a special deep dive about Carrie, I think, to commemorate Ooh. that. Good, yeah. looking forward to it. Oh, I need to give a rating, don't I? Uh, what, what is it? So it, it's, fr it's room temperature, fridge or freezer? Yeah. I'm going to say fridge. It's not freezer. Really? It's, really? Yeah. yeah it's, did you think it would be room temperature? No, I thought it would be freezer. No. I, just, I feel like there's so many iconic, horrifying scenes from it. No, it's not Freezer because I, I, I very rarely find King stories actually scary. Um, but it's certainly Fridge in the, like the, the powerlessness of Paul Sheldon. Um, but the other thing I'll be interested to think if, if and when you read it is whether you like Paul Sheldon, because I don't at all. And every time I, it's the book I probably read the most times in my life because I had to write a lot about it back in the day. I probably read it about 15 times. And every time I read it, I like him less and like Annie more. Um, and the more you like her, her okay. in a weird way, the scarier it gets because you you understand her more. So yeah, I would yeah. say it's fridge, dead sense of top end of fridge. Wow. Yeah. Okay. My next book is The Last Days of Jack Sparks by Jason Arnott. Have you read this one? I haven't, and I know I should have, but I haven't read it. It is about Jack Sparks, who is a kind of bad boy journalist provocateur in this world. What you are reading is a posthumous manuscript because he was researching his new book on the occult and he died in the process of researching it. So what you are reading a lot of the times is the manuscript he was writing. And so oftentimes you'll read and you'll see notes from the editor or clarification or, you know, notes added after the fact for extra context. So as you are reading this, like I said, he was very much a provocateur. He is one of the most unlikable characters. And I feel like <laughs> everyone who I recommend the book to makes a note of that. So I'm just letting you know, now, listeners, if you pick this up, he is an asshole. Like, that is just <laughs> the type of book you are reading. But also, as you're going through, you see kind of the breaking down of this persona because you are reading his manuscript. So he is very much writing in this smug, arrogant persona. And as it goes down and things start to get more real, you kind of see that start to fade away as he finds himself in more 
vulnerable situations. So one of the inciting incidents at the beginning of the book is that he is at the Vatican witnessing an exorcism and he laughs and the the person who is possessed like snaps their let their neck to look at him. Oh. <laughs> and then he is on his way home at the airport and sees that he's getting all these notifications because someone loaded this very dark grainy video to his youtube channel and he has no memory of doing that he did not upload this video and he can't seem to take it down and things are just going crazy and that is just the start of like weird things that are happening while he is still trying to maintain that none of this stuff is real and kind of keep this like arrogant douchebaggy persona but you are also reading this knowing knowing that he dies at the end of the story so you're also trying to figure out like which of these inciting incidents is the thing that finally <laughs> does it <in. laughs> it was a very interesting reading experience and i read it while i was working uh overnight at a bakery and uh, there was one scene where i was scared to walk to my car afterwards was after it a demon scene it was right i'm never remembering why i haven't <laughs> read this book yeah i'm I'm just so scared when it's to do with possession. I just, yeah, really don't like it at all. So it mm. is a very scary subgenre. So I, for me personally, because the scale is very personal to each person, I'm putting it in the freezer because of the memory of just that scene and okay. being scared to walk to my car. <laughs> so that is the last days of Jack Sparks by Jason Arnott. Yeah, I need to catch up with it. He wrote Ghosted too, right? Yeah, which I think is also a little bit self-aware in some way i haven't read anything yeah, by him like, but... yeah. yeah okay i will check it out i will i will summon the courage if i can get through phil for cassie's boys in the valley i can do anything so i will <laughs> i will i will give it a go um well yeah uh, my my second choice is one i read last year and it ranked very high on my favorite books of the year and it, it's katrian awards looking glass sound which I had no idea was going to be a metafictional book until I, well, pretty much finished it. Um, so I'm very, as anyone who's read Cat Ward stuff will know how much they hinge on these high concepts. And I'm really reluctant to spoil it by saying the wrong thing. So I'm going to basically chicken out and, and read the, the, the cover synopsis. Is that okay? Just to make sure yeah. that I don't ruin anything. So in a nutshell, right. In a cottage overlooking the windswept main coast, Wilder Harlow has begun the last book he will ever write. So right away we're doing it's a book about writing. So okay, so far so meta. Um, it is the sto it's the story about the sun drenched summer days of his youth in Whistler Bay and the blood stained path of the killer that stalked his small vacation town. Um, about the terrible secret that he and his companions Nat and Harper discovered entombed in the coves off the bay. And how that day echoed down the decades, forever shaping their lives. But the more Wilder writes, the less he trusts himself and his memory. He starts to see things that can't be real. blah de blah de blah de blah de blah um, Entire chapters he doesn't recall typing, appearing overnight. Who or what is haunting Wilder? So, it's quite overtly an ode to Stephen King, according to Cat Ward. Because it's set in Maine. It's about an author protagonist. And things that happened in his youth and, you know, coming of age and all that sort of stuff. You're like, okay, it's a nice, oh, yeah. cosy Stephen King story. It's completely not. It's much closer to something like Shirley Jackson with that weird uncertainty of what are the rules here? What is this world? Who are these people? Yeah. What are the relationships? Um, and it's also reminded me an awful lot in the latter stages of Donna Tartt's The Secret History. Because a lot of the book takes place in college. Right. I'm not being very clear. Everything I've just read to you there is basically the first quarter of the book. This is why I didn't understand what I was getting into. You've got like the synopsis relates to the first quarter. This kid comes to this coastal town, makes friends, gets in, involved in a murder mystery. It's kind of like a really creepy version of the famous five. And then things, the things that happen affect his life going forward. He goes to college, he tries to write in a story of what happened to him. He has a weird roommate who seems very interested. He gets in a relationship with a girl. 
there are many, many, many retellings of the things that happen to Wilder, some by himself, other people by the people he's told the story to, who have their own version of that story. And it's basically a book about the retelling of stories and how far you can get from the truth and what truth and memory even are. And that's where the meta stuff comes in. Like, what are the rules that govern a story? What is truth when it comes to story? What does truth mean? You get all those kind of philosophical questions. But the reason I loved it is twofold. One, you get all that experimental stuff that sounds really wanky and like, you know, a bit annoying. But it's wrapped up in this genuinely compelling story about this mystery in this this small town that's genuinely creepy and properly compelling, great characters. So it never feels like an intellectual exercise. It is a story first and foremost. And then the best thing is, and we're very careful here, you think all of that stuff about, the, all that clever stuff you think is still, you still think, all right, there is no fourth wall has been broken. It's still all wrapped inside the book. And then in the very, very end, there's the implication that actually maybe it's a whole other kind of meta in which the line between the world of the book and your world as a reader isn't as sort of safe and secure as you think it is. And you kind of end up potentially affected and, dare I say it, potentially cursed by what you've just read. And it's like the stakes suddenly change completely in this final sleight of hand that, that Cat Ward pulls off. It's just the cleverest book without it ever being irritating. I loved it. I loved it. It's just, it's the best thing she's ever written. Way better than Needless Street. And people love Needless Street. Um, I would say it's room temperature because it's a very much a gothic novel rather than a horror novel. Gothic in the way that something like Shirley Jackson's uh, Hangs a Man or or we have always lived yeah. in the castle, you know, that kind of gothic, rather than Hill House gothic. Um, yeah. Donatar, again, the secret friend, the secret history, that kind of gothic that doesn't make you scared. It's just kind of awkward and uncomfortable and creepy. But the murderer, the dagger man, does like wander into people's bedrooms and fill them on his phone while they're asleep. So there's also that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, have you, you've read this, I presume. Yes, and I agree. I think it is my favourite of mm -hmm. hers that she's written and yes i just remember just when i thought i don't trying to talk about it without giving anything away but yeah just when i thought there could not possibly be another layer there was another yeah. layer i'm like yeah. how is it it's just it was kind of like those like is it cake and it just gets like increasing <laughs> <laughs> it's so true is it get yeah 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 but it's like the cake is a cake oh no the cake is not a cake like the knife is a cake you know like the, the video is camera cake. is a cake yeah yeah, yeah. exactly yeah yeah, it's so, so good. My final pick was also one I read last year, and that is Good Girls Don't Die by Christina Henry. And this is hearkening more towards what we were talking about with The Truman Show in a way. So we have, it starts off with a protagonist who wakes up in a house she's not familiar with, with a man who is acting like her husband and a child that is calling her mommy. And she has no idea how she got here and she's just kind of trying to piece things together and like apparently she works at this restaurant and after a while she kind of pieces together i am in a cozy murder mystery hmm. and she's just trying to outsmart the things and being aware of the tropes but as you go on you see she's not the only character we see another character who wakes up in a car on a way to a cabin in the woods with a few of her rowdy college friends. And we're like, oh no, <laughs> where's this going? <laughs> and it's interesting because all of the chapters kind of start off with these exchanges like, oh, you know, I just think if you were aware of the tropes, like if you knew all this stuff, I could easily survive this scenario. I would be the one to outsmart everything. And then you see like, okay, well, what does happen when that person is fully dropped? into that yeah. scenario. Reading it, honestly, it felt like my nightmare. <laughs> like being in that situation and people being like, Stephanie, you love horror movies. What are we supposed to do? Like, mm. I don't know. <laughs> don't ask <laughs> me. <laughs> so it has that, but it also has kind of the 
very competent genre savvy characters to root for in a way it's a it's a balance of that but it was a very fun thrilling read if you like the idea of like playing around with tropes and genre awareness i would say it was also very room temperature but a fun thriller okay that is good girls don't die by christina henry just to come back to you a second if you like that and i haven't read it so this may be a false comparison but have you heard of the book the oh hang on the seven deaths of evelyn hardcastle I did start it and I was so confused. Right. <laughs> I, I felt like I needed a map. I needed to write down things hmm. that were going on. It was not a casual reading experience. I will tell no. you that. Because <laughs> I interviewed the author. She, it, just to explain to listeners, it's a similar thing. It's like you the, the, playing with the tropes of a cozy crime, Agatha Christie style murder mystery, but it goes in mad directions. It's kind of like, it's like, what if Agatha Christie wrote a Black Mirror episode? You know, it's that yeah. kind of thing. Um, and I interviewed Stuart Turton about it, and I still don't think I fully understand what went on. My wife <laughs> does, but she's an engineer. She's much smarter than me, much smarter than me. Um, but it, yeah, it just made me think it sounds like a similar thing, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is a little more, you could enjoy it as a casual read. You don't need okay. to have a, a spreadsheet keeping track yeah. of everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, Great segue because spreadsheets, oh, yeah. yeah, like buckle up. My my third pick, and I am sorry, listeners, it, it, it is House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. Danielewski, I think so you say it. Um, really? Now, I, I, yeah, I was reluctant to talk about this book because, one, it's really hard to talk about without having a copy in front of you to show people. Um, and two... Generally, as I've said elsewhere, people who love this book are sometimes not the best people to have conversations with. It, it's kind of like the goth's version of Infinite Jest and all of the baggage that comes with that. Um, but I love it and I think I'm nice. So let's let's give it a go. Uh, but I'm glad you've read it. I know we said off air that because I need help with this one. Um, so the synopsis alone, where do you even start? Um, it's a big old book. And basically, right, <laughs> um, there are many different levels of narrative. So let's take them one by one. A, a guy called Will Navidson moves in with his family to a house on Ash Tree Lane. And Will is a like war photographer, a war documentarian. But he's come home because he's like, he's, his wife's sick of him being away and risking his life. So they, they go in pursuit of domestic suburban bliss and they buy this house. And then early in proceedings, Will finds a corridor in his house that can't be there because it's set in a wall that is an exterior wall. So if you look out the window, the space the corridor has to be in isn't there. It's just garden. You get what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And the, the, the corridor leads to a staircase and the staircase deck leads down to what is essentially a limitless endless labyrinth of, of like stone um, and there's nothing in it apart from something that growls every now and again but you never know if it's a monster or what it is but it's this endless infinite labyrinth that at one point they work out is at least longer than the circumference of the earth so it's impossible in every way so that's scary enough that entire experience becomes the basis for a a piece of footage um that makes its way into kind of subculture. So I think I've forgotten. Is it the is it the four and five and a half minute hallway? The video is called something like that. It's, it's something like two, that. Yeah. Two and a half minute five. I've read this book countless times. I've forgotten five five and a half minute hallway. That's the film that Will makes documenting his explorations in this labyrinth. Um, but of course, we're reading the book. We can't see the film. What we see is a textbook, basically an analysis of the film written by a man called Zampano. So that's how we find out about what the film is and how we find out Will's story, by reading Zampano's analysis of the film. And that's the main body, literally on the page, that takes up the centre of the page, Zampano's writings on the film. And then in the margins, on all sides, are notes in a different typeface written by another character called Johnny Truant who has found Zampano's book 
And then in the, you've got footnotes to both of those, both to Johnny's comments and the book itself. You've got footnotes that kind of fight and compete and sometimes are longer than a page in themselves. And it's a whole thing. And it's just a, the book is the, the book is a maze in the same way that the the maze in the house is a maze because it yeah. becomes typographically weird. The some bits you've got to read in the mirror, the some bits where the, 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 the letters on the page start to take the shape of the physical maze as 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 will is as, as, as zampano is writing about will walking down a narrowing corridor the page gets narrower yeah. so it's it's playing with the interface between words and the things that those words are trying to represent and i could literally talk for an hour about it and i have <laughs> um <laughs> Check out my Patreon, guys. It's all <laughs> no, I, I have I've talked at length for it. And I, I won't go on too long, but it's a book that is, in essence, about truth and about what is truth and what is our access to truth. Um, and there's, I don't want to talk too long, Stephanie. Let me say a few more things. I realise how long I've been talking. Sorry, but um, there's, there's two things that make it like the ultimate postmodern metafictional text. Right at the end, Will gets lost in the labyrinth. And the only thing he has left is a book. And he has a match. And he he has one match. And he, he strikes it. And he lights the top of the first page of the book. And by the light of the book burning, of that page burning, he reads the line below the flame until it's burned out. And then he uses that to light the next page. So the act of burning a book is necessary to read it. The act of destroying a book becomes necessary to read it. So it's a whole thing about creativity and destruction being hand in hand, which I just find fascinating. And of course, you then find out that the book he's reading is House of Leaves, the book you are reading, which is impossible, yeah. right? And then the other thing that just makes it the ultimate metafictional comment. And right at the start, you asked me, why is this so scary? Why is metafiction? used in horror and i talked about like our lack of access to truth what you come to realize reading the book is that the entire thing is impossible so johnny truant the guy who is commenting on this book in the very first few pages tells you that he is a liar he tells you he lies all the time so what can you trust that is coupled with the fact that zampano the man who has written this book about the film is blind so how has he seen the film to write the thing he's written? How has he even done that? You know, and then on top of that, you've got the fact that all he's really writing about is a film. He's not he wasn't there for the experience. He's just seen the film. And Will, we know, is a gifted photographer. So that could be fake. And at every level, there is reason to doubt what you're reading. So in the end, the entire thing becomes about the act of interpretation and the act of trying to find truth in words and the impossibility of truth in words because there's always a gap between the person writing them and you reading there's always a gap and that's what the book's about and and finally because every layer is like an act of interpretation zampano is interpreting the film johnny truant is interpreting zampano there are some editors who are unnamed who are commenting on the whole thing i th theorize that every piece of analysis that is ever written about that book becomes part of the book. This conversation we are having is part of the book. It never ends, like like the labyrinth. Sorry, I I need to sit down. <laughs> yeah, sorry, lecture over. Wow, I just I feel like I need to take a seat and really <laughs> process that. All the anal we are House of Leaves now. We are a part mm. of it. Yeah. Imagine my poor wife. This is the kind of thing I talked about. And it, like at this level of intensity as well. I love that. I told you I read House of Leaves several years ago, and it is one of the books that got me into reading horror. I definitely did not read it with the same depth or lens that you did. But I just remember the idea that the experience about it transcended the page. Like I felt like I was going mad. Mm hmm as I was oh, reading it. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of being able to elicit so many emotions by just rearranging text on the page and making it such an immersive experience. Mm. Mm. But I I absolutely loved it. 
but I feel like I'm due for a reread. But it is uh, an undertaking for sure. Well, I, I, I tell this story a lot, but I always say that when I was, the, the, it was kind of like the centerpiece of, of my work, House of Weeds. It's the, I think it's the final statement on Metafish. I don't think you can do anything else. I really don't. Um, but I remember one day going mad, sitting in my office at the university with a mirror to like read some parts. It was like 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. I had a mirror and the book. And I also, I'd found one paragraph that I'd realized there was a code in the paragraph that if you took certain letters from each word, it spelt out a new thing. And I'm sitting there doing this. And I had this sudden realization of like, what am I doing with my life? There, there are people out having like, going for walks and playing sports and with their loved ones. And I'm in an empty office cracking a code in a ghost story. Uh, it's funny. What you just said just reminded me of the level Swifties look into everything <laughs> Taylor Swift has written for like cryptic messages and Easter eggs. And they're yes, <laughs> she's speaking to them in a code. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so true. Swift is the um, yeah, yeah. Midnight's is the house of leaves of, of, of popular music. <laughs> Swifties would love House of Leaves, <laughs> is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that's so true. Oh, oh, and by the way, it's also Freezer because it, yeah. it does convince you you're losing your mind. Like yeah. the one bit where where Johnny Truant has a kind of weird thing in a cupboard where he feels like there's this dark entity after him. And he, and he says to the reader, because he's writing to you, and he says, yeah. like, it won't be now, but at some point in your life, you will start to feel certain ways. And what he describes are basically the symptoms of like an anxiety attack. And he's like, you will feel a certain way. And that's when you know it's coming for you. So like, even no, when you close the book, you're like, I can never rest now. I can, till the day I die, I can never rest, you know? It's like the unsound from the black tapes. It's coming yeah. for us all. Yeah, terrifying. We've been book. marked, Daniel, so. Yeah. We've been marked for death. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I know you and I both also had honorable mentions we wanted to, to add to this. One that I wanted to talk about that I don't see mentioned often um, is The Ghost That Ate Us by Daniel Krause. I get the full title because it is one of those that has more after the subtitle. It's here. Okay, The Ghost That Ate Us, it's small print. The tragic true story of the Burger City Poltergeist by Daniel Krause. It is a book about this fast food restaurant in, I want to say it's Iowa, who starts to experience all this supernatural phenomena and what you are reading is daniel kraus as a character as he's an author in this world he is daniel kraus interviewing these people after the fact <laughs> and doing kind of this true crime novel it's paranormal so it's not quite like true crime but you get what i mean about the whole incident and where this left everyone after the fact is it like taken seriously or is it a bit of like a yes. joke book? Okay. And I think it is, it's also about the trauma that these characters have experienced and what that does to them. Like, how do you, um, some of these people died. Like, how does that affect you when you have seen your coworker die in front of you? Yeah, and and I I thought it was more of a sort of funny, you know, that horror store by Grady Hendrix. I I thought it was more yeah. that kind of thing. I didn't realize it was. But I, I'm more interested now that I know it's it takes its premise seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is okay. like pictures and stuff. Like it is like a a true crime novel. Like this really happened. Here's the newspaper article that was written about it. Here's like all these documentarians went to go oh. see this. And here's how it affected this town to suddenly have this big thing that happened there. This was kind of a nowhere town. All right. That's very cool. I might check that out. Yeah. Because I love that kind of scrapbook thing. You know, when you, here's all this information. Do with it what you will. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, oh, cool. Right. Because I'm, 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 Daniel's great. I mean, I read Whale Fall this year and it's one yeah. of the best books I've ever read. So He's now, he can do no wrong for me now. So I will, I'll <laughs> check it out. Um, speaking about that blending of, of reality and fiction, the one that comes, well, actually, no, there's two. Um, Chasing the Boogeyman by Richard mm -hmm. Chismar. I'm very proud I can now say Boogeyman because I used to say Boogeyman and I got, I got mocked by Americans for it. So now I, I have to really brace myself and say Chasing the Boogeyman. Um, 
Yeah, that is. It's. I haven't read obviously the Daniel Craig book. I'm assuming that it's kind of a kind of a similar thing in that yeah. Richard Chismar is the character. Yeah. But I think the idea. It's been a while here, and I loved it. The idea is that it's it's quite clever. The idea is that 19 year old Richard Chismar wrote a book about some serial killings in his hometown, and then modern day Richard Chismar has supposedly found his early writings and has republished them is that right yeah yeah i think okay so. yeah so you get two layers of fake richard chismar which is yeah. always fun um and it, it again it's that same thing about like there's the real names in there there's elements of real geography elements of real history elements of real people in richard's life a lot of the stuff about him starting up as a writer and starting cemetery dances in there um but then it's got this just this this like serial killer just parachuted in um and it's but what i i mean i i do love the meta element of that book but what i love more is just the book itself because i think he writes about like the nostalgia of youth just beautifully it's such a beautiful beautiful book about like how how wonderful and awful it is to be on the cusp of young manhood it's really really good like rose tinted glasses about serial murder um but the other one that i always think of in the same breath as doing a similar thing is Brace and Ellis's Lunar Park, which is a book I love and often quote because not enough people talk about it. And that is similar. It's a book in which Brace and Ellis is the main protagonist writing um, about his life. And so much of it is real, but there are these fake elements like the fact that he's married in the book. And as a kid, it mean, he doesn't in real life. Um, but he has written American Psycho in the book. But in the book, he's also been haunted by a kind of Patrick Bateman-like figure so it's a, it's it's a they call it auto fiction I believe it's the blending it's when you take yourself and write about your life but fictionalize it but it's done to like really scary effect and it has a great scene in the middle where that him and his son are kind of terrorized by a giant carnivorous Furby doll, um, which is it's just fun right? But though yeah, yeah. so those two books are it's a it's a different kind of meta it's not about oh look at how cool my word plays it's more about where does the line between real and fictional begin and end and it's they're both very cleverly done on the best of the year episodes i do those with my old co-host rachel and that was oh. we do a backlist section and that was her best of backlist Park. title for this year yeah oh well well, I like to find people who like it because it, it's a different kind of British than Ellis because it's the kind where you realise he is a human being and he's not he's not he's not he's not he's not the guy who wrote White, you know, and stuff like that. There is some heart to the man. He has a heart and it still beats. I quite enjoy that. One I read a few years ago is Human Shaped Fiends by Chandler Morrison, and this is in that same kind of horror western series that justin coons does the artwork for i think it mm -hmm. used to be like death's head press but i think they've changed so this is an entry kind of in that series where you are reading this you know period piece horror western story and then it zooms out essentially to chandler morrison writing this book and struggling with like the next part of this book and him in real time quotes but deciding how to plot out this book which i thought was like kind of fun as i was reading it i was not expecting that going in <laughs> so it's like horror west world it's like the western bit is fake and then you get the bit behind the scenes where they pull in the the, the strings i like that i guess so yeah yeah is it horrible because i've never read him but sadie hartman told me about along the path of torment and he, he, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued and a bit reticent it's definitely gory and i would say like the levels of violence are are pretty high and then you know you have him kind of like sitting back smoking a cigarette <laughs> analyzing the scene he just wrote <laughs> also kind of dealing with his reputation as a horror author and like the kind of horror he's known for and his thoughts on that so it is just kind of a funny oh that sounds cool forth, like. okay so it's like if misery had just gone full on metafictional then basically like a guy yeah. saying tom his own career okay that sounds cool yeah um the last one i'll mention and it, it's weird to mention this as a kind of afterthought because i think it's for me personally the scariest book i've read in the 20th century uh 21st mm -hmm. century sorry I forgot, I forgot what century i'm in um yeah it's the scary this is the scariest book i've read published 
since the millennium. And it's Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts. And I think there's a bit of personal stuff going on because I said I possession stuff freaks me out. Um, but this is kind of like for possession what Wes Craver's new nightmare is for sleep demons, right? It's like, where does the reality and fiction end? Um, and it's about a, a family, two young girls, one of whom, when they were kids, was possessed by a demon, or was she, or was she just mentally unwell? Um, and they, there was like a a, a, a a documentary crew came in, a kind of, I don't know what you guys call it in the States, we have a show called Most Haunted, is that something that you have over there? We definitely have. Those kind of paranormal, oh, like, yeah. yeah. Um, one of those shows comes in to film her and then there's a whole element where somebody is blogging about that show and about what went wrong in the making of that show and the horror at the end of the series and the, the episode that was never broadcast and all that sort of stuff um, and it's about what's real, what's fake compiling different like narratives together blogs and it's very pop culture savvy in the way we're talking about right at the start it it very much knows it's it's it sits right in the middle of like possession movie culture the exorcist exists in this world stuff like that um very self-aware and i'm always impressed by books that can have all like the tricks and bells and whistles and still be scary because normally when you do that stuff that becomes the thing rather than the actual scary thing you know but there's a mm-hmm. scene in the middle of head full of ghosts to do with you guys call it a playhouse. We call it a Wendy house. Like, a, and it's just the most chilling thing I've ever read. It's such a scary scene. So, oh God, it's so frightening. And to do that within a really experimental metafictional book is just shows how good Paul Tremblay is. It's yeah. The only reason I didn't pick it as one I want to talk about is because I felt like my other three were more of a nice little three tiers of what meta can be whereas that sits in a weird space in, in the middle of it all um, but it's yeah. so good so good everyone should read head full of ghosts i second that i love head full of ghosts and i love that the the possession show exists in the wider world of paul tremblay's works it's referenced in the paul bearers club like she mentions like did you ever watch that show about that girl who was possessed Yes, I remember that one. There are loads of links and Easter eggs, but I don't read Paul's books yeah. like close enough together. But I always li- miss them because I read them quite, ev- you know, every now and again when one comes out. So it's not like King where I can see it all. I always miss the links, but I remember that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, so good. Yeah, that's so scary. One of my one of my all time favorite books as well. Wow. It. I just remember my jaw was on the floor reading the end of it, and I remember even on subsequent readings just still being yeah the bit in the coffee shop at the end with the blogger when you realize what what the implications might be yeah yeah it's great well should we talk about some chilling obsessions yeah yeah Yeah. because i i've got a really like up to the minute one (laughs) all right tell me what you've been enjoying i have become obsessed by the survival of the uruguayan rugby team in the andes have you watched Society of the Snow yet on Netflix? No, I haven't. But are you aware of this story about the Uruguayan? The Andes thing? plane crash, yeah. Yeah, there's a million names for it. The Miracle of the Andes, all this, this stuff. But it's the guys in the 70s who crashed in the Andes and then they turned to cannibalism um, to survive. And it's it's weirdly a story of heroism. Like most tales of cannibalism, it's kind of like a little bit sordid and you get into the icky details. But with this one, it's much more of a celebrated story about overcoming like friendship and overcoming adversity and i saw the movie alive like when i was a kid years ago the one with ethan hawk from 93 still the scariest plane crash ever committed to film um but this new film has come out on netflix by um J. A. bayona the society of the snow and i watched it over the weekend with my wife who was obsessed by this story obsessed by plane crashes and all kind of things um and we watched it and i was kind of completely disengaged by it for the first hour because it felt too clinical. It felt, again, like a documentary almost. It was too chaotic. And then in the last 10 minutes, I just realised I cared so much, burst into tears at a certain scene, like was in pieces. Uh, and I've now, I just I just think it's such a cool story. And it, I, I, I love survival stories about cannibalism because I'm a, I'm a sick little puppy. But it's nice <laughs> that this one has a happy ending, right? It's It's got yeah. happy endings. You, you get all the grimness of how they survived and the horror what happened to them 
And the first nights just sounded just like the worst thing you can imagine, like Dante's hell. But then you get a happy ending, you get to cheer. So that's why everyone wins. And, and to yeah. give a quick shout out to some, if people want to know more about it, by all means watch the film. But I've been listening to a lot of podcasts that touch on it. And um, last podcast on the left, they do, they, they've done a three part series, which is brilliant. And weirdly, for those guys, quite respectful. You don't feel like you're mocking the survivors. They, they're kind of really on board in, in all of them, but it goes into like all the gnarly details that, that the films leave out. You find it about people's intestines being pushed back in their bodies and all manner of things. So that three part is amazing. Um, and there's also a podcast that has now finished, but it was great when it first when it was on. It's called Casting Lots. And it's a podcast all about survival cannibalism. Um, and they did a whole thing about um, the Andes. But yeah, but that story is my my chilling obsession at the minute. I just can't get enough of it, what they went through. Wow. Okay. The You're Wrong About podcast also did an episode on that, um, which is how I had heard about it. Okay. My conflicting obsession <laughs> of the moment is the release of Gypsy Rose Blanchard and just really thinking about the ethics of consuming this type of content for this girl who, I mean, are you familiar with the case at all? It is I'm like sorry, I'm really not. Is this, a, is this a bad thing to not know about? No, I mean, it's very American. I don't know if you were familiar with the show The Act with Joey King, but this is a real thing that happened. This girl was a victim of Munchausen by proxy by her mother. Okay. and like she was in a told she couldn't walk she was in a wheelchair she was being given all these medications and the the daughter met someone online and essentially arranged for her mother to be murdered in order to be set free because of the extreme abuse that she was facing she just got out of prison this the, the daughter or the person who did the yes yes right and so everyone is very excited for her to experience things for the first time because the only time like she was under this very abusive upbringing and i just think as a person who was very familiar with the story i am just wary of the the amount of people watching her and the just the scale of everything this this woman has never really experienced adulthood everything she knows about freedom and being an adult she learned in prison like how does this this woman doesn't know how to navigate social media like she's i don't know i'm just oh. like worried for her so she went to prison as a kid um she actually didn't know she was a legal adult her mom told her that she was much younger than she was which was another layer oh my to the god abuse she was facing so yeah like she this woman was extremely abusive so a lot of people are like yeah, you should have killed your mom. She was abusive. <laughs> and, and this is this is a this is a grim question. But how did she kill her mother? Um, she didn't do it. She met a, a guy online who uh, I'm trying to remember. I believe he stabbed her in her sleep. Right. So yeah, yeah, not not good then. Yeah. Wow. So, so I'm just worried about the uh, the size of the platform that she has and the the amount of people looking at her at this girl who doesn't know how to navigate this mm. world like she's going to say something weird you know i just <laughs> just a bit yeah just a bit <laughs> i don't know i think part of me is just worried about her and it just reminded me of that ethical true crime uh episode i did with adam caesar so that's just something i've been thinking about a lot is yeah i need to google this cool. but also like her her and her mom were very public figures. Like she did like make a wish stuff. She, her mom lived in a Habitat for Humanity house. Um, so she's kind of used to being this public figure. And I think she, you know, she does a lot of TikToks. She likes speaking to the microphone. I'm just like conflicted about it. Yeah. Like it's kind of like someone sit this girl down and just talk to her about the world. Right. Like, oh, yeah. wow. Cause I'm not ready for TikTok and I've been in the world <laughs> for like the last 10 years, you know? So, wow. Okay, that there that does sound ethically problematic. Yeah, that's that's one. To, I'm going to look into this. Now, this has passed me by entirely. Yeah. Cool. But she, yeah, she's doing talk show interviews. She's doing podcasts. I'm like, this girl's got put right right to work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You get her on the show. I'm sure she'd probably got horrible. What she could talk about. Get her on. I imagine the ratings. God. Yeah, join the circus. 
that's awful though right <laughs> yeah so that's my my thing i've been obsessed with recently just that whole situation yeah. um, but so you know the other tradition we have on the show is to ask our guests for a final girl song hmm. so in this metaphor neil you are you are in a horror movie what is your final girl song um well i always feel weird with this question when you asked me last time i think i said isabel's decoration day um because mm-hmm. i always think i need to come up with like a really feisty female singer and i never do and it always feels bad um but i think about what what song would i want to walk you know walk away from the explosion to and not look back um and i basically want to shout out a band that i found last year that have become one of my favorite bands ever and they're a band called spanish love songs which they're not a big band at all but they write what's known as sad boy punk is what i've heard i love this i love the sound of this please keep going and all they've got an album called brave faces everyone and it 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 makes it brings me close to tears because there's not a single love song on it. They're all heartbreaking, angry songs about the state of the world or how hard it is to be a millennial and like the failed promise that of growing up when the world is getting worse, you know. And it it's just so it's such an emotional album because right at the end there's a, a refrain where it just says. After all that, it just goes brave faces everyone. It's kind of that right game face on. I just find it really moving because, but really depressing because it's so true about what it is to be like our age right now. Yeah. Anyway, they have one song on the new album called Here You Are, and it has a stanza in it that just, I think I want a t-shirt. And the stanza is, there's a kid with a trust fund asking me why I'm not famous. I wonder if I take his fucking skin, can I stay in my apartment? And I just think, yes, that is, that is, that is my creep, my anti (laughs) sort of inequality chorus for the year. If I take his fucking skin, can I stay in my apartment? So yeah, like here you are by Spanish love songs. That's my, that's my pick. I, We'll be checking that out right away and adding that to the final girl playlist. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on here and kicking the year off. This is the first themed episode of the year with Metafiction. Well, thank you just so much for letting me talk at such length about and in such confusing tangles about this stuff. I really appreciate it. Of course. I mean, I think to me, that's the best part of the show is having people on and watching them geek out about things that they love and little niches of horror that they they love. It's my favorite thing. Well, it's it's been a delight to do because I haven't visited some of this stuff in like 10 years. And it's it's weirdly a purging this because it's such a <laughs> in many ways an awful part of my life when I went quite mad writing in my dad's shed on my own for like 14 hours a day. Um, so to to come on here, pressure off and just talk about what little I managed to piece together from my theories. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. I really do appreciate it. And I'm glad to help. Where can people find you online? Um, so I'm pretty much on, on all social medias at Talk Scared Pod. Um, but I mean, they're all offering diminishing returns these days. Come, I'm on Instagram and Twitter most. Threads has just become a hive of vipers. So, it, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out where's the best place to be. But it's all of them at Talk Scared Pod. And the website is TalkingScaredPod.com. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on threads, Instagram, and TikTok at Books in the Freezer. You can send us an email at booksinthefreezer at gmail.com. Show notes for this episode and all previous episodes will be at booksinthefreezer.com where you will find a linked list with all of the books mentioned as well as links to several different ways to support the podcast. One of the ways to support the podcast is to become a Patreon supporter at patreon.com. There is a one, three, and a five dollar level. You can also save, I believe, a five or ten percent if you do like a 
annual payment instead of a monthly payment but there are different things offered at every tier things like early episode releases access to group chats movie nights bonus content so check that out if that is interesting to you you can find that at patreon.com slash books in the freezer and if you're thinking wow i wish there was a way i could show support to my favorite podcasts without spending money I am here to tell you there are ways to do that. You can go to a site like Apple Podcasts and write out a review. It doesn't need to be long. It doesn't need to be anything. Just write a title and say, you know, discovered this show, loving it, having a good time. Anything like that, obviously a five-star rating, those are a huge help to podcasts and getting exposure and interaction. All of that helps. So a big thank you to all of you who have taken the time to do that. If you listen through Spotify, it's honestly even easier. You can just go to the podcast page and it'll have a rating system there where you just can star rate it there. You actually don't even need to write anything. Just leave a star rating. But also if you listen on Spotify, it does give you an option to leave a comment after the episode and say what you thought. So those are always really fun to see. So thank you for doing that as well. But also just word of mouth, just talking about it, just mentioning it on social media, you know, participating in the reading challenge this year, all of that helps as well. So So thank you so much for doing that and continuing to do that. I'm Stephanie and see you next time on Books in the Freezer.